Hi, everyone. Welcome to the American Museum of Natural History. My name is Marion, and I'll be your tour guide today. We are going to look at some of the giants of the museum. We're going to look at some of the largest animals that ever lived and some of the largest plants that ever lived. I don't know if I started too soon. Again, my name is Marion. I'm your tour guide today as we look at some of the giants of the museum. And we're going to look at some of the largest animals and plants that ever lived. We're going to start in the Hall of Biodiversity and we are looking at a giant clam shell. The shell is four feet wide and over a hundred years ago, it was living in the South Pacific Ocean off the coast of the Philippine Islands. And it weighs over 500 pounds. So do you think it was always this large? Because we're gonna talk about how these giants got to be so big. Do you think it was born this big? Or that it even had a shell when it was born? So no, um, the giant clam can release as many as 500 million eggs. And each one we can barely see, it would be smaller than the head of a pin. So when these eggs get released and fertilized with sperm from another giant clam, the eggs are fertilized. And after a couple of days, they will hatch. And the little larva, which is really tiny and doesn't have a shell yet, will float around and eventually start to form this shell and the shell will continue to grow for the entire clam's life. So one of the ways it gets so large, first of all, it has the shell to protect itself, but it also grows its whole life. And we know these giant clams can live to be a hundred years old. So that's another way they get to be so big. So how do we know how old the clam was? Well, they lay, this, as the shell gets, um, produced, it uh, creates rings. And do you know anything else that has rings that tells us how old it is? Trees, right? Trees have rings and we can tell how old they are. Also, if anybody's been to the T-Rex exhibit, there's a fossil there that tells us how old the T-Rex was. So the, um, so the shell continues to grow. And then what's really important is what kind of food does this clam eat to get so big? it actually has a combination feeding strategy. So most of the nutrients come from algae, photosynthetic algae that live in the clam. And the clam has um, something called a mantle, which is attached to the shell and surrounds the body of the clam. And the mantle is really cool because the mantle secretes the minerals or the calcium carbonate that makes the shell but it also provides the habitat for the symbiotic algae, I'm gonna to try to pronounce it, zooxanthellae um, that live uh, among the clam. So it's symbiotic relationship, meaning that the clam protects the algae and also provides through its filter feeding some uh, food for the algae. And the algae of course provides a lot of energy for the clam through photosynthesis. So the clams have to live in fairly shallow water, maybe 20 um, meters deep. They like shallow, warm uh, coral reefs because after that little larva that was born and starts forming a shell, it will sink to the bottom and attach to coral where it will remain for its entire life. So the, um, the clam doesn't move around to catch food. Besides getting food from the algae, it will also capture food um, as, as plankton will drift by and other small uh, animals and fish. So the mantle, as I said, secretes the material for the shell. It provides the habitat for the algae, but it also has light spots on it. And now we're moving on to our second giant. What's 40 feet long and has the largest eyes in the animal kingdom? Look up, it's the giant squid. And what makes this giant squid so long are those two gigantically long tentacles. 
let's look at those tentacles. They are really important for this squid to get super big. It uses these to catch prey. So unlike the clam, the squid doesn't live very long. It only lives to be about five years old and also doesn't have a shell to protect it. Look at those tentacles. They have those razor sharp suckers that are used to capture prey. We can see them on the tentacles and we'll also see them on the arms. So squid have eight arms and two very long uh, tentacles. Giant squid can be about 40 feet long because of the tentacles. The body itself called the mantle uh, doesn't get to be that long. It gets to be about six or seven uh, feet long. And we're going to examine uh, some more of the anatomy besides the tentacles. Here you can see the six arms and a hole in the middle. That hole is the mouth. And we're going to examine the beak because that's very important too. So let's just take a look at this for a minute. We have the hole in the middle, which is going to be the mouth and the beak, and then the hole below, which is called the siphon or funnel. And this is a really cool thing. So squids eat, uh, Priscilla wants to know what squids eat, a lot of cool stuff. They can eat um, fish and um, other squid. And what they'll do when they capture them is to uh, bring them to their arms and then the arms into the mouth and the beak will break it into smaller pieces. And inside the beak are something called the radula and that has razor sharp teeth. So that radula, and the, it's really important that the food get broken up because the esophagus goes through the brain. Okay, this is weird, but <laughs> that's what happens there. And we are moving along the, um, oh, I want to see if we get another shot at the siphon. Great. We have another shot. The siphon's important, as I said. A lot of stuff comes out of that siphon. So it can jet propel. So the squid is a great hunter because of the tentacles, but also it can move really fast through jet propulsion. So it brings water into the mantle and then pushes it out through that siphon. And it can go up to 20, 25 miles an hour to attack prey. And the siphon also expels waste. And the babies come out of there. So um, a lot of cool things happen there. So Ashley wants to know if giant squids can actually take down ships. I'm not sure, Ashley. I'm going to say no. But their biggest predator is the sperm whale. And um, the sperm whale as you may or may not know, dive pretty deep and the giant squid lives, lives pretty deep um, in the twilight zone below where there's sunlight. That's why those giant eyes are used to absorb a lot of light to find prey and watch out for predators. But the sperm whale um, is the main predator. And uh, we often wonder who will win the battle between the squid and the sperm whale. And it's almost always the sperm whale because we find wins because we find sucker marks on it. Um, but I like to say if um, what if the sperm whale was already down below and the fight was going on, or the sperm whale was already underwater for over an hour, sperm whales are mammals and have to come up for air. So I wonder if it was being held down by the um, giant squid, if it needed to come up for air, if that would be a problem. But um, but the other part of the anatomy, which I didn't mention, thank you, is um, it has fins, and those fins are used to help stabilize it, and it can also cruise around a little. And as we continue along the Hall of Biodiversity, we're going to enter into the Hall of Ocean Life and see the largest animal that's ever lived and is still living today, but not in the museum. So this is a model of a blue whale. This whale is 94 feet long. That's as long as three school buses end to end. Everything about the blue whale is enormous. Its length, its heart is as big as a small car. I like to think of a zip car or, um, Oh, like a golf cart. So it's huge. And when the whale dies, it can beat maybe like three times a minute. Its tongue is as large as an elephant. So its tongue 
Uh, we'll talk about the tongue when we talk about what it eats. So again, here's a great view of this whale and notice how it's suspended from the ceiling. It has a steel pipe, this model of course, has a steel pipe going through it. And then the uh, steel beam or pipe goes through the ceiling of the museum and it's just anchored there to give us this beautiful shot. So how does the blue whale get this big? Well, it, babies are born, they are the largest babies ever. So the babies weigh about three tons and are 25 feet long. So they start off really huge, but have to grow very quickly. And they are born tail first. So humans are born head first. Baby whales come out tail first. So they can get that boost up to the surface of the water to get their first breath of air. They need oxygen to live. And then after that, they will nurse on the mother's milk for um, about a year. The mother's milk has over 30% fat. Now we drink cow's milk and that would be about 4% fat. So they have this very rich diet. So David wants to know why the blue whale is gray. It's actually a bluish gray. And I think it's that color for so that it's not easily seen in the ocean. And I know the bottom can be almost like a yellowish color. Um, what are the lines though? So notice the lines in the throat, um, the bottom of the throat and part of the stomach. Well, if it's actually the stomach, but it would be part of the throat, which is huge. When the blue whale opens its mouth, those pleats will expand to let in thousands of gallons of water. The blue whale is a filter feeder. What do you think it eats? I'm going to give you a clue. It doesn't have teeth. It's a filter feeder and doesn't have teeth. It has strips of baleen, these baleen plates that hang from its upper jaw. Baleen is made from keratin. That's the same material that our hair and fingernails are made out of. So it's flexible, but hard, and it acts as a filter. When the blue whale dives down and gulps thousands of gallons of water, it takes in krill. So it eats krill, which are shrimp-like crustaceans. We actually use krill for much of our um, fish oil uh, comes from krill. And then it, um, so it's swallowing, it can swallow, um, a ton of krill at one time. During feeding season, it needs to eat about four tons of krill a day. And, um, and it's, it swallows the water and captures all that krill. It will use its gigantic tongue, um, to push the water out and filter the krill that it can then swallow. And Scarlett wants to know how big the tail fin is. I do not know. Let's see how big that tail fin is. If the whole whale is 94 feet long, what do you think? At least a couple feet wide, right? I'm not sure about that. Um, it also has two fins on the side. The eye looks small, but it really isn't um, as small as it looks. And the whale can, um, can be, uh, blue whales live to be about 70 to 80 years old. Um, and as I said, they can be about, um, this one's 94 feet long. It was a female. This is based off of a female whale that lived about a hundred years ago, uh, off the coast of South America. And we get this great view of the blue whale. And as we leave, uh, the Hall of Ocean Life, we're going to make a right hand turn back into the Hall of Biodiversity and look at the largest flower that ever lived. Here it is up on the spectrum wall of life. It's high up on the spectrum wall of life, but it actually looks close to the ground. This flower is called Rafflesia, and the blossom is about three feet wide and weighs about 15 pounds. It is the largest blossom ever. Now it lives close to the ground, either on the ground or close to the ground. And this plant has no leaves, no stem, and no chloroplasts, which means it doesn't photosynthesize. So there is nothing green about this. Oh, Aiden, how does it smell? Well, not so great. It smells like rotting meat. It's really disgusting from what I've heard. And it will attract 
hundreds of flies because the flies think it's rotting meat. Look at the petals. It has five petals. They're each about an inch thick and they look like sort of carry on or decaying flesh. And the flies will crawl into the center and they will get pollen all over them. The flies will then go to another blossom where they will get, where the pollen will um, fertilize the plant, the flower, and then the seeds will get dispersed. And because this blossom only lives for about six days, it's really hard to get for these seeds to get fertilized. And um, the seeds will fall to the ground and eventually, we didn't talk about how it gets energy, it attaches to a vine. So this, the Vaflesia is a parasite. So it has, doesn't make its own food. It will suck the nutrients and water, which it needs like all plants need from the host vine, which is related to um, a grapevine. And you can see the inside here. Um, it has filaments um, that help it um, suck the water and get nutrients. And, um, and then it will live on the vine um, for years before it starts to have a, um, a bud. And the bud will, most of the buds don't survive, but the bud will get bigger and bigger for three or four months. And then um, this blossom will just explode, as I said, for about six days, um, in which time it needs to um, fertilize and produce seeds. And it can produce about 300,000 seeds um, which, uh, again, some of which will attach to a vine. It's very difficult for this, um, for the Rafflesia to reproduce, um, partly because it has limited time. It's, there's only one vine that it depends on and that it's found in the rainforests of Indonesia and the, this habitat is being, uh, destroyed for logging and other purposes. Um, people looking for this blossom if they're lucky, they can smell it and find it, but they'll also look for the buds, um, which are around for several months and become quite large. So it is possible for these um, botanists and other people um, to find this amazing flower. And here we see another giant um, and we are looking up at the lion's mane jellyfish. So this is the largest jellyfish. Um, it's, it's uh, bell can be six feet wide at least, and it has, can have 1200 tentacles. So these tentacles can be, how big was the, uh, let's see, the blue whale was 94 feet. We're going to see a dinosaur that's 120 feet. These tentacles can be actually about 120 feet long. And they are stinging tentacles. They have something called, hmm, let's see if I can get this right, um, nematocytes that um, have neurotoxins and will sting their prey. So if you get stung by a giant lion's mane jellyfish, it won't, it'll hurt a little, but it won't um, do much damage to you. It will paralyze their prey, however, and then their long tentacles will bring their prey um, to their mouth. Oh, Kara, thank you for this wonderful question. How long do they live? They only live for one year. So the clams, the giant clams lived for 100 years. The blue whale lived for about 70 or 80 years. And the squid lived for five years. And these guys, like most jellyfish, only live for about one year. 95% of their body is water. And what's amazing is that scientists have been able to find a jellyfish fossil that lived 500 million years ago. So that's kind of crazy since most of their um, body is water, but it did leave a thin film um, on some sediment that got fossilized. So we do have that um, evidence of a huge uh, jellyfish. And they do live, thank you, Justin, they do live, um, they do like cold water um, and live pretty deep uh, in the ocean and are found in most oceans, but they like the cold water. We are looking at another gigantic plant, a tree, the sequoia tree. This is the largest tree by volume 
that um, has ever lived. And it only grows in a certain um, very special place in California in the Sierra Nevada mountains. So on the west side of the Sierra Nevadas, here we're seeing this is a real, this is the tree that our piece of sequoia was cut down from. So here we see um, <laughs> two men in 1891 starting to cut down this tree. Its nickname was the Mark Twain tree. So if you want to find more out about this specific sequoia, you can look up Mark Twain tree. So two of the things that are amazing to me, because this tree can grow to be 300 feet tall, are the seed and the pine cones. The pine cones are only about two and a half inches big. They're smaller than an avocado and they contain thousands of those very tiny seeds. Now we're looking at a timeline. We're going back in history, looking at the timeline of this tree and we know how old it is because of the rings it produces as it grows. It grows for its entire life. And this tree started growing Wait for it, wait for it. 700 AD, five, 600 AD, 550 AD. That little tiny sequoia seed came out of a sequoia cone, probably because of forest fire. That's the main way that the cones are dispersed. The cones are covered in resin and the forest fire will melt that and help release the seeds. And the seeds and the tr will, will grow. The tree needs, as I said, this perfect kind of um, climate. It grows at altitudes of about 5,000 to 7,000 feet in the mountains and gets a lot of water from uh, the snowpack from the Sierra Mountains melting. So the soil is right. The water is right. These trees are really, oh, and let's talk about the bark for a minute. So we know they they grow big because, well, they start really tiny, but they grow big because they live a long time. They have the perfect climate, but they also have this amazing bark that is fire resistant, drought resistant, fungus resistant, beetle resistant. The bark can grow to be almost three feet uh, thick. So amazing bark. Um, and the rest of the tree. So David, this tree was cut down in 1891 and only two slices pieces were saved. One was sent, uh, well, it was cut down for um, the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, known as the World's uh, Columbian Exposition. And I'm not sure what happened to the rest of the tree. It's not great for um, lumber because the tree is brittle. So my guess is most of it just got um, destroyed when it was cut down. Uh, we're not, it's illegal to cut down sequoias today. So how is it fire resistant? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's just the size of the um, bark. I know there are, there are chemicals inside that make it fungus and beetle resistant and probably also help it to be um, fire resistant. And we are going to head up to, um, we have two more stops on the fourth floor. So we're taking the elevator um, to come out on the fossil fall, fall and look at the largest dinosaur so far um, to have ever lived. And this is the titanosaur. And this is a very special species of titanosaur. So let's look at its head. We can see that it's a sauropod long neck dinosaur. Look at those teeth. They are pencil-like teeth. What do you think they ate? They strip leaves off of trees, like most sauropods or long neck dinosaurs. So this titanosaur is about 122 feet long. Can't even fit, the whole thing can't even fit inside this giant hall. Its head is sticking out to greet visitors. And we see its long neck and long tail. And this was found in Patagonia um, in 2012, I think it was about 2012, 2013. A rancher was looking for uh, some lost sheep and came across this gigantic um, bone that he knew was a fossil. Here we get a good view of the skull again and those pencil teeth. So you can see they're not sharp enough to eat meat. This is an herbivore. 
Um, oh, how many teeth does it have, Ashley or Aiden? I'm sorry, I'm not sure how many teeth. That's a great question. I do know that it had about 200 bones um, and about 80 have been found. So this is a model of based on six titanosaurs that were found at the same time. Now we don't know the gender of these titanosaurs, but we do know that they were all juveniles, meaning they hadn't completed growing yet. When a dinosaur finishes growing, it has this last layer of molecules that it puts down that we know it's um, an adult and it hadn't completed that yet. So we could joke that maybe there's an animal out there, a dinosaur out there that's larger, the adults to these juveniles, but there is a limitation um, to the size of, of a land, any land animal, unlike the blue whale, um, which his body does not have to support uh, that 200 tons of weight. The titanosaur um, probably weighed about 70 tons, and that might be about the maximum um, that its weight could support. I'm not sure how long this titanosaur lived, um, I knew, I know that T-Rexes lived, um, the oldest one lived to be about 28 years old. And, um, and so, um, maybe sauropods also lived to be, uh, in, in their twenties. I'm not exactly sure. The bones on display here are actually, um, a model. Um, when the, when the, uh, titanosaur was first excavated, we did have, um, on display for about a year, some of the real uh, fossils, and they look exactly like the fossils you're looking at now. The color is based on the minerals in the ground. So we will have different um, dinosaur fossils that are different colors depending on where they were um, actually excavated. And we're going to uh, go on to our last um, giant. Uh, as we go through the hall of, of vertebrate origins, we just saw Megalodon, and a mosasaur, we're going to pass a quick look at the largest finger that ever lived from a pterosaur. And then we're gonna go through a gift shop, how about that? Um, as we go into the Cerisian Hall of Dinosaurs where T-Rex lives. And we have a patasaurus on our left and a real fossil egg that we're seeing. See that on the left? That could be a large giant too. And now we are seeing the largest footprints and the hmm, second heaviest fossil in the museum. So you may know, or second heaviest, sorry, object in the museum. The heaviest object is the Anagito meteorite that weighs 34 tons. This trackway, which is a fossil, and we'll talk about that, weighs about 20 tons. So imagine getting that into the museum. So what we're looking at are footprints from dinosaurs that walked in the mud about 107 million years ago. And we're gonna look at two types of footprints. We see a theropod footprint there. Those are three toes with sharp claws. So we know that they're theropod, which are meat eating dinosaurs. Um, like a, well, like a T-Rex or an Allosaurus. So these are three-toed, um, sharp-clawed dinosaurs on the same branch as birds. So the footprints look very bird-like. Here we see casts of uh, some of the footprints. And we can talk about what footprints tell us. Um, footprints can tell us how big the animal was, how quickly it walked. Did it walk in groups? Did it protect their young? Um, when these footprints or trackway was excavated, uh, we weren't sure if it would survive the, the move and the reconstruction. So casts were made of the footprints. But the way fossil footprints, the way footprints become fossils, these are called trace fossils. So they're not actually parts of the living animal, but they are evidence of, um, of something about the animal and it's, and the way it looked. So when these dinosaurs walked in the mud, the mud needed to dry up and be covered very quickly, just like a bone needs to be covered very quickly to fossilize. So the, um, 
this river in Texas, the Paloxi River in Texas was covered over with sediment. Very quickly, the sediment dried up and any organic material that was in the mud would have been replaced by minerals. And the minerals in the mud also um, allowed this to become fossilized. And as the sediment got covered over and covered over, the um, it got compressed and eventually became rock. Um, so this trackway, when it brought when it was brought up, the whole trackway that was excavated was about ten meters long, or thirty feet long. Extremely heavy. Each footprint was or this, it was cut up into blocks, and each block was transported back to the museum. So part of it went to a museum in Texas, and part of it went to a museum here. And um, I hope you'll get a chance to come into the museum and, and see some of these um, giants for yourself. I want to thank you for coming and let you know the museum is open. Again, I hope you'll thank you for joining me today. And I hope you'll come and see these giants in person and find some more giants in the museum on, on your own. Um, thank you for the great, great questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to answer all of them. Um, but. Uh, that was our tour of uh, Giants of the Museum today.